God is dead, and we have killed him. Friedrich Nietzsche's famous declaration of the death of God sent shockwaves through late 19th century Europe. As he saw it, traditional religion and philosophy had lost their legitimacy. They could no longer provide any solid foundation for our lives or for understanding our purpose in the universe. For Nietzsche, the death of God posed the problem of nihilism, the absence of any secure meaning or value in human life, casting us adrift into an absurd and meaningless cosmos, a vast nothingness or nihil encompassing everything. Nietzsche's probing diagnosis of the modern world would go on to spawn a vast array of thinkers and movements, from existentialism to phenomenology, deconstruction, and postmodernism, each trying to grapple with the conditions he first exposed. And we still find ourselves in this predicament today. The problems of nihilism and the death of God are still very much our problems. But what if I told you that Nietzsche wasn't the first philosopher to confront the problems of nihilism and the death of God? What if I told you that these problems were faced head-on, explicitly, and by name, in an earlier controversy in classical German philosophy from the late 18th and early 19th centuries. This moment was the so-called Pantheismusstreit, or Pantheism Controversy, which involved all of the greatest German philosophers of the period and laid the foundations for the next 200 years of European thought. In the balance of the pantheism controversy hung the fate of the Enlightenment and modernity, the fate of faith and reason, religion and philosophy, the fate of freedom of the immortal soul, and even God, God's self. Our story will take us from the renegade Jewish philosopher Baruch Spinoza to the heyday of the German Aufklärung, or Enlightenment, through the philosophical revolution of Immanuel Kant, and eventually the birth of German idealism itself. As we'll see, it is the German reception of Spinoza's radical pantheism, his view that everything that exists are merely modes of the one infinite substance, called either God or nature, that spurs a new confrontation with the limits of reason and philosophy itself. Spinoza's rationalism was accused of fatalism, amoralism, atheism, and ultimately nihilism by the German thinker F. H. Jacobi, who instead advocated an irrational leap of faith towards a transcendent God. While Kant tried to resolve this dispute by staking out a critical compromise between faith and reason, the German idealists found themselves dissatisfied with this solution and instead worked to synthesize Spinoza and Kant into a higher unity. G. W. F. Hegel, arguably the greatest of the German idealists, argued for a grand reconciliation of all these opposing viewpoints in such a way that simultaneously recognizes the standpoint of nihilism and the death of God. Hegel recasts them as necessary moments in the larger narrative of God's own self-actualization in the world, culminating in the realization of absolute knowing and absolute spirit. In other words, God's own self-knowledge in, through, and as us, as our own self-knowledge, achieved above all in philosophy itself. We'll conclude with some objections to Hegel's system, considering whether or not Hegel succeeded in resolving the problems at hand. After a long period of neglect, contemporary scholars are returning to this seminal moment in the development of European philosophy in an effort to understand how we got to where we are today and to see whether these thinkers of the past may hold the key to some of the most burning issues of our present moment. The renaissance of the study of Hegel and of German idealism more broadly stands at the exciting forefront of contemporary philosophical developments.
To understand these developments, we need to understand the emergence of German idealism from the pantheism controversy. But to see how that story goes, we'll need to begin from the beginning. My name is Dylan Shaw, and I'm a PhD candidate in the Department of Philosophy at the University of Toronto, writing a thesis on Hegel's concepts of reconciliation and absolute spirit. This video is the first in a series on the pantheism controversy. This first video will explore Spinoza's philosophy and its reception in Germany, which first spurred the controversy. Future videos in the series will explore Kant's response to Spinozism and Hegel's effort to reconcile Spinoza and Kant, his attempt to complete the grand journey from nihilism to absolute spirit. Baruch Spinoza was born and raised in the Portuguese Jewish community of Amsterdam and lived during the Dutch Golden Age, an unprecedented period of political, economic, and intellectual freedom that heralded the birth of the modern world. Spinoza is typically categorized as one of the three great early modern rationalists, alongside the earlier René Descartes and the later G.W. Leibniz. While writing his great works of philosophy and corresponding with other leading figures of his time, Spinoza turned down a prestigious academic invitation from the University of Heidelberg, choosing instead to earn his living as a humble lens grinder, making important contributions to the telescopes and microscopes that drove the scientific revolution. At the age of 23, before any of his works were published, Spinoza was famously excommunicated from the Amsterdam Jewish community, ostensibly for his heretical philosophical views, as we'll soon discuss. He published his theological political treatise in 1670, anonymously, in order to avoid attracting additional controversy. And for the same reason, Spinoza's undisputed systematic philosophical masterpiece, The Ethics, would not be published until after his death. Spinoza died at the age of 44 from lung disease, likely brought on by the inhalation of silicon dust from grinding lenses. But his posthumous influence on the development of European philosophy would far exceed what he could have ever imagined in his own lifetime. Where does Spinoza's system fit within the history of philosophy? It is said that his rationalist predecessor Descartes was the father of modern philosophy, insofar as Descartes was the first to break with the dogmatic commitment to traditional religious belief that supposedly dominated the prior medieval period, coinciding with the breakthroughs of the scientific revolution to which Descartes also actively contributed. In this way, Descartes opened up a new freedom of thinking and philosophizing that would come to characterize the spirit of modernity and the enlightenment. In his meditations on first philosophy, Descartes uses a method of radical doubt to cast away all of the received truths of traditional religion and philosophy in order to find a single indubitable truth, if there is any such thing, and build back up an unshakable edifice of certain knowledge on that basis through the exercise of pure reason alone. This single indubitable truth turned out to be Descartes' own existence as a thinking substance. I think, therefore I am. And starting from there, Descartes claimed to prove on pure rational grounds the truth of the most important tenets of religion. For example, the immortality of the soul, the freedom of the will, and the existence of God. Descartes, in the end, offered proofs for God as conceived in the most traditional sense, that is, an all-knowing, all-powerful, and all-good being, or infinite substance, who created and sustains all finite substances in existence, not least we finite human beings, from which God remains radically transcendent and distinct. Now, Spinoza was deeply inspired 
by Descartes' efforts to break from the dogmatism of the past. But Spinoza set out to do so more radically and thoroughly. Just as the scientific revolution had made its breakthroughs in physics by drawing on mathematics, Spinoza modeled his philosophical system in his magnum opus, The Ethics, after Euclid's Elements, the foundational text of geometry. Indeed, the full title of Spinoza's work is Ethics Demonstrated in Geometrical Order. This geometrical order refers to Spinoza's philosophical method. Just like mathematics, each part of Spinoza's ethics begins with a series of indubitable or self-evident axioms and definitions from which new propositions are deduced through ostensibly rigorous deductive inferences. In this way, Spinoza aims to achieve an even higher level of certainty and indubitability than Descartes did. Insofar as Spinoza's system follows the method of the most certain of all pure rational inquiry, mathematics. By following this new method, however, Spinoza would come to reach conclusions that diverged sharply both from traditional religion and from the Cartesian system of his philosophical predecessor. So, what is Spinoza's philosophy all about? After providing its first set of axioms and definitions, the ethics begins by demonstrating the existence of a single infinite substance, which, as Spinoza writes, can be called either God or nature. Of course, Descartes, and virtually all of medieval philosophy before him, had also sought to prove the existence of God as an infinite substance. But Descartes also thought that in addition to this infinite substance, there were a variety of distinct finite substances namely the finite creatures which make up the world of creation, including human beings. In contrast, Spinoza argues that there can be only one substance, and that this substance is necessarily infinite. On Spinoza's view, all finite beings exist as modes of this one infinite substance, that is, as modes of God or nature. In other words, God is not transcendentally separated from the world. Rather, God is the world, or better yet, the world exists within God as a part of God. After all, if infinity is that which is without limit, then the finite could not possibly exist outside of the infinite, in which case the infinite would be limited by what lies outside it, namely the finite. Rather, the finite must exist within the infinite. This will come to be the metaphysical basis for describing Spinozism as a form of pantheism, the view that all pan is God, theos, though perhaps his system would be more accurately described as panentheism, the view that all pan is in n, God, or theos. As the ethics continues, Spinoza argues that everything in nature all the finite beings that exist within God's infinite substance follow by necessity the laws of nature, which themselves follow necessarily from the essence of God. This simultaneously vindicates the modern scientific notion that everything happens in accordance with the mathematical necessity of the natural laws of physics, as well as the theological notion that everything happens necessarily in accordance with God's will. Thus Spinoza explicitly denies human beings freedom of the will. On Spinoza's account, everything we do, we do necessarily without the possibility of ever having done otherwise. This may seem to pose a problem for traditional notions of moral responsibility, as we'll see. But for Spinoza himself, this determinism or necessitarianism is the crux of both the theoretical and the practical dimensions of his philosophy. Theoretically speaking, Spinoza's necessitarianism allows us to achieve a rational knowledge of the world around us and of ourselves, all of which obey the same necessary natural laws of cause and effect. There is a sufficient reason for everything that happens, and these reasons can be discovered by us through rational inquiry, at least in principle. Practically speaking, Spinoza's necessitarianism 
provides the necessary remedy for all the so-called bad affects, including shame, guilt, regret, hatred, cruelty, anger, and so on. If everything one does, they do necessarily, then shame, guilt, and regret make no sense at all. Why should one be ashamed or guilty or regretful about something they did if there was never any possibility for them to do otherwise? Likewise, if everything that everyone else does, they do necessarily, then hatred, cruelty, and anger make no sense at all. Why should I hate someone or be cruel to them? or be angry with them, if they must do what they did. For Spinoza, all of these bad affects are variations of sadness, which he defines as a decrease in one's own power, conceived as a kind of vitality or life force, the constitutive striving for which Spinoza calls the conatus. The titular ethics of Spinoza's ethics is an ethics of joy, which he defines as an increase in one's own power or vitality. Spinoza calls us to increase our own joy as much as possible, and by extension to increase the joy of everyone else as much as we can too. Against the bad affects, Spinoza prescribes a life lived with nobility, tenacity, and above all, love. Love of oneself rather than shame, guilt, and regret love of others rather than hatred, cruelty, and anger, and love of God. Indeed, at the climax of the ethics, Spinoza argues that the highest joy consists in the intellectual love of God, amor de intellectualis, which is achieved, according to Spinoza, through the practice of philosophy. The intellectual love of God is the joy one receives when they comprehend and contemplate the necessity of all things the ways in which everything happens in accordance with the laws of nature, and the ways in which this necessity all flows necessarily out from God's eternal essence. Of course, on Spinoza's view, we ourselves are a part of God. Thus, in one of the most sublime passages in the history of philosophy, Spinoza writes that God loves himself with an infinite intellectual love and that the intellectual love of the mind towards God is part of the infinite love with which God loves himself, wherein lies our true salvation and blessedness. Needless to say, Spinoza's views proved to be extremely controversial, both in his own lifetime and long after. As we know, Spinoza was excommunicated by his own Jewish community. His theological political treatise was condemned by the Dutch church at the Synod of Dort and banned completely in his native Netherlands. Shortly after his death and the publication of the Ethics, the entirety of Spinoza's corpus was placed on the Catholic Church's index of forbidden books. Why did all of these different groups find Spinoza's thoughts so objectionable? To begin with, Spinoza's philosophy was taken to be tantamount to atheism, a grave offense in the intellectual climate of his day. But how could anyone think that Spinoza was an atheist, you might ask, given that he begins the ethics by proving the existence of God? Spinoza's critics contended that Spinozism amounted to the denial of any god worthy of the name specifically the denial of a transcendent and personal God. It is perhaps no coincidence that Nietzsche saw Spinoza as his one true predecessor. By identifying God with nature, advocating for a view of God as identical to the world, pantheism, or as containing the world, panentheism, Spinoza would seem to be denying the traditional religious view of a God who transcends the world, creating it from the outside. By maintaining that all of nature operates according to necessary natural laws, Spinoza would seem to be denying the traditional religious view of the personality of God, that is, of a God who makes decisions and acts freely. 
a God who reveals himself to prophets and responds to prayer, a God with whom humanity can enter into a personal relationship. Relatedly, Spinoza's philosophy was taken to be tantamount to a moralism and fatalism. If everything that happens, happens necessarily, it would seem as though we cannot be held morally responsible for our own deeds. Any notion of moral praise or blame, reward and punishment, and so on, would have to be discarded. The issue of Spinoza's view on the personal immortality of the soul is somewhat complicated, so we'll leave that to the side for now. Not to mention Spinoza's radical democratic politics and his questions about the authorship of the Bible, which surely rubbed the traditionalists the wrong way. For all these reasons, Spinoza became a persona non grata in the intellectual world of early modern Europe. It should be noted, however, that not everyone read Spinoza as a rebellious atheist. Novalis, the romantic poet, would call Spinoza the God-intoxicated man, whose highest ideal was to lose oneself entirely in God's infinite love. And Leibniz, the great early modern rationalist, saw Spinoza as genuinely committed to the reality of God. Leibniz read Spinoza's philosophy as emerging from Kabbalah, the tradition of Jewish mysticism, which explicitly espouses a pantheistic or panentheistic worldview, summed up in three Hebrew words, Ein od mil vado, there is nothing but God. God is everything, and everything is God. There is a good historical case to be made for this, including Spinoza's known exposure to works of several contemporary Kabbalistic thinkers, like Abraham Cohen de Herrera's early 17th century Gates of Heaven. Nevertheless, Leibniz himself would still criticize Spinoza on philosophical grounds, returning instead to a metaphysics resembling Descartes, where a transcendent and personal god exists distinct from the world of nature. And so, with the critical reception Spinoza received, it was look as though his thoughts were destined for the dustbins of history. But our story doesn't end there. Fast forward to the late 18th century, where the German Aufklärung, the Enlightenment, is in full swing. The Enlightenment's new freedom of thought that began in the Dutch Golden Age has spread to the many corners of Europe, including to the Jewish community of Germany, where it went by the name of the Haskalah, Hebrew for reason or intellect. The greatest representative of the Haskalah was Moses Mendelssohn, a German Jewish philosopher who was widely read and respected even in the non-Jewish intellectual world. He famously defeated Kant in an essay contest put on by the Berlin Academy. Kant would later call Mendelssohn's Jerusalem an irrefutable book. At the core of Mendelssohn's project was an effort to show that Judaism was a thoroughly rational religion, in the sense that it affirmed the same purely rational truths shared by all the Abrahamic faiths, despite their different external trappings. These truths, according to Mendelssohn, were the immortality of the soul, the freedom of the will, and the existence of a transcendent God. As a follower of Leibniz, Mendelssohn maintained that these three truths could all be defended on purely rational grounds. Thus, Mendelssohn argued, Judaism ought to be tolerated alongside Christianity and Islam, and the Jewish people ought to be treated equally as fellow citizens in Germany, a radical political proposition at the time. The great German playwright and Enlightenment supporter, Gotthold Ephraim Lessing, was so taken with Mendelssohn's works that after striking up a deep personal friendship, Lessing used Mendelssohn as the model for the titular hero of his play, Nathan the Wise, 
where the wise Jewish merchant Nathan argues that the adherents of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam should all mutually respect one another and live in peace, insofar as they are all called to serve God in the spirit of love. Our story takes a turn, thanks to an exchange between Lessing and another German intellectual and literary figure of the period, F. H. Jacobi, a devout Christian, which would spawn the famous pantheism controversy. Following Lessing's death, Jacobi claims that Lessing had confessed to him that he, Lessing, endorsed the philosophy of Spinoza. If indeed true, this would have been a scandalous confession to make at the time. Until then, the Aufklärers, the German Enlightenment thinkers, had been insistent that Enlightenment thought was fully compatible with the core teachings of traditional religion, as Descartes and Leibniz had believed. But Spinoza's philosophy was viewed as fundamentally incompatible with traditional religion. How could Lessing have possibly endorsed such a dangerous philosopher as Spinoza? Upon hearing of this accusation, Mendelssohn entered into correspondence with Jacobi in an effort to defend Lessing. Perhaps Lessing had not been fully serious in his confession, or perhaps he meant only to endorse a certain limited part of Spinozism and not its most radical theses. Yet Jacobi insisted that Lessing had been a full-blown Spinozist and that this had profound consequences for the very project of the Enlightenment as a whole. Jacobi shared the fundamental critique of Spinoza that had prompted Spinoza's initial excommunication, ban, and villainization in the earlier 17th century. Firstly, Jacobi maintained that Spinoza's pantheism, his view that God is simply nature itself, was tantamount to atheism, since it denied the existence of a transcendent and personal God, a God worthy of the name in Jacobi's view. Secondly, Jacobi maintained that Spinoza's necessitarianism, his view that everything happens necessarily, in accordance with the natural necessity of the laws of nature, was tantamount to amoralism, since it denies the possibility of freedom and moral responsibility. In a later letter to J.G. Fichte, the German idealist philosopher, Jacobi would coin the term nihilism, derived from the Latin word nihil, meaning nothing, to describe the final result of Spinoza's philosophy. By denying all transcendence, whether the transcendence of a god beyond nature, the transcendence of human freedom above the laws of nature, or the transcendence of a morality given by God and obeyed through free will, Spinoza's philosophy would leave us with the empty nothingness of the natural world, in which all things merely flow back into the abyss of the purposeless matter from which they first arose. In a word, endorsing Spinozism would amount to the death of God. For Jacobi, without a transcendent God to guide us, human life would be utterly lacking in genuine meaning or purpose, the nihilistic predicament. Jacobi argued that Spinoza was the most consistent Enlightenment philosopher. Thus, it was no surprise that Lessing the great proponent of the Enlightenment, should ultimately have come to endorse Spinozism. As Jacobi saw it, Spinoza's system was the most rigorous and precise articulation of modern rationalism. If you follow the road of pure reason alone, Jacobi argued, the road of Enlightenment modernity, then you will inevitably end up at Spinoza. Even Leibniz's philosophy endorsed by Mendelssohn ends up collapsing into Spinozism on this view. In other words, for Jacobi, modernity, the Enlightenment, and pure reason all lead to the embrace of atheism, amoralism, and finally 
nihilism. For Jacobi, this meant that pure reason needed to be given up in order to avoid falling into the Spinozist trap. Instead, Jacobi advocated for a self-avowedly irrational leap of faith, a salto mortale or deadly leap into belief in a transcendent God, freedom of the will, and the other key tenets of traditional religion. Only irrational faith, Jacobi argued, could save us from the nihilism of rational knowledge as epitomized by Spinoza and the Enlightenment. Indeed, for Jacobi, even our belief in reason itself is just that, a belief, a matter of faith. The controversy between Jacobi and Mendelssohn over Lessing's purported Spinozism and its broader implications for the Enlightenment would take on a troubling personal dimension. In the course of their correspondence, Mendelssohn informed Jacobi that he intended to publish a new book titled Morgenstunden, Morning Hours, in which Mendelssohn would directly address Lessing's views on Spinoza, the issues with Spinoza's pantheism, and their implications for the Enlightenment, modernity, and the relations between reason and faith, philosophy, and religion. Jacobi felt that it was unfair that Mendelssohn would be the one to address these issues publicly, since it was he, Jacobi, who had had the conversations with Lessing about Spinoza. Moreover, Jacobi was worried that Mendelssohn would paint him in an unfavorable light. Indeed, it was Mendelssohn's unstated intention to beat Jacobi to the press in order to diminish the shock value of the revelation of Lessing's cynicism. And Mendelssohn intended to accompany this revelation with the necessary clarifications to soften the blow. But Jacobi, in turn, decided to beat Mendelssohn to the press instead by publishing their complete correspondence with added commentary without Mendelssohn's permission. Jacobi's subsequent book, Concerning the Doctrine of Spinoza in Letters to Moses Mendelssohn, would initiate nothing less than a full-scale intellectual revolution in Germany. Mendelssohn himself was deeply distressed by its publication. As the legend goes, he hastily composed a reply, which he ran to deliver in the midst of the freezing cold Berlin winter, but being in such a rush, he forgot his overcoat. Mendelssohn fell ill that day and died just a few days later. Mendelssohn's friends and supporters blamed Jacobi for this death, rightly or wrongly, and held Mendelssohn up as a martyr for the cause of enlightenment and reason. Jacobi's hope was that his takedown of Spinoza would convince Germany and Europe as a whole of the dangers of rationalism, the Enlightenment, and modernity, the ways in which these inevitably lead to nihilism and all the terrible consequences associated with it. But in a grand historical irony, Jacobi's work had the exact opposite effect of what he intended. It instead initiated a revival of Spinoza in Germany, a passionate renaissance of interest in Spinoza's philosophy that would radically change the course of European thought. For these new German thinkers, Jacobi's irrational leap of faith was a betrayal of the free rational thinking that characterized all that was good and valuable about modernity and its break from the dogmatism of the past. Yet while Spinoza did offer a beautiful image of the interconnectedness of all things within God's infinite love, this couldn't be the whole answer either. The people wanted more. What would follow would be an effort to take Spinozism and raise it up into a new and higher form. But before seeing how this neo-Spinozism would take shape, we must take a brief detour into another philosophical revolution already in progress at the very same moment in history. Stay tuned for the next video in this series, where we'll explore Kant's response to Spinozism and the pantheism controversy, where he'll attempt to stake out 
a middle ground between the demands of reason and faith. Until then, as always, keep seeking.